earn my money. All right, well, thanks. So I'd like to tell you about approximate computation. That means what you think it does. You have some problem that you want to solve that's intractable, either in the sense of being NP hard or complete, or that it takes n cubed time or something like that, where you might only have something like n or n log n. And the connections with something that I'm going to call uh, regularization. So if you're familiar with that term, I'm going to be using it in exactly the same way, except taking a fairly non-standard approach to it, but exactly the same way. If you're not familiar with that term, what regularization is, is a general class of uh, techniques and machine learning and statistical data analysis for, in some sense, computing a more robust or more useful answer. You know, typically defined in terms of what the downstream practitioner cares about, so better classification or, or whatever. And of course, you can formalize it in various ways. So you know, I've thought a lot about some of these theory questions and also a lot about applications in scientific and data analysis. And I think that some of the questions that we're talking about here um, really sort of get at the heart of uh, the disconnect um, that, that the workshop is sort of addressing in some senses. So the motivating observations are following. So I don't think anyone's going to argue with the observation that uh, the theory of NP completeness is a very useful theory. So it's a theory, so it's an imperfect guide to practice, but really it's a very useful theory. It provides a qualitative notion of fast. It provides qualitative insight into uh, when algorithms will perform well or not. You heard about linear programming and some of the things. In some sense, this is really sort of the exception that proves the rule. I think it's also fair to say that in a wide, wide range of large-scale data analysis applications, uh, the modern uh, theory of approximation algorithms is uh, nowhere near as analogously useful, and that's part of the motivation for what we're talking about here. Um, hit the bounds you get are very weak. You can't get constants. Dependence on various parameters is not even qualitatively right. Doesn't provide analogous sort of qualitative insight. And so, can we get beyond this? So, I'll start with the conclusions. Uh, the first is the claim I just made. The second is a claim that if you've played around with practice, we were talking yesterday about um, putting your boots on and, and getting into some data. If you've played around with practice, you'll know that um, approximation algorithms and approximation heuristics, we've heard they're essentially the same thing, except you can't maybe prove results about the latter, but approximation algorithms are various heuristics, you know, binning, pruning, all sorts of things like that oftentimes implicitly perform regularization in the sense that oftentimes if you do them, you'll get more robust or better solutions as measured by what some downstream analysts will care about. So one question is, you know, if we're thinking about large scale applications, when we run an algorithm, we're actually doing something. So can we characterize what we're doing? Can we characterize the regularization properties implicit in worst case algorithms. So the usual perspective is, geez, you know, I want to compute this intractable thing. It's intractable in some sense of the word. So I'm going to settle for the output of an approximation algorithm. And this thing is good in some sense insofar as it approximates this. But you've also just computed something. So rather than just saying, geez, I computed something that approximates this, can you say, you know, in fact, I exactly optimized something else? And in particular, can you say, geez, in fact, I exactly optimized a regularized version of this? Because if you can, then what you're saying is that I've computed, in fact, a better answer than if you had given me an oracle to the intractable problem. So I'll present an empirical uh, slide at the end, having to do with a particular application in large social and information networks. And those things are sparse enough and noisy enough and expander-like enough that all these things uh, come into play. And in fact, that's exactly the case. And so in that application, if you had given me an oracle for the intractable problem we wanted to solve, it would have been worthless. On the other hand, understanding the various approximation algorithms and essentially the implicit statistical properties or the implicit geometric properties or the implicit embedding properties uh, that were going on with them was really crucial for the downstream application. So solutions to approximation algorithms need not be something we just settle for. I mean, they're actually what you want and better. So you know, computer scientists, as you know, view the data typically as a record of everything that happened, all the uh, purchases at Walmart, all the clicks at a web page. And the goal is to chew on the data to find something interesting, which you want is probably hard in some sense of the word. And so you develop approximation algorithms to be fast. But the data are all there is. You chew on the data. Now, a very different perspective is what maybe statisticians and machine learners would say, which is you know, the data are so valuable because they're a particular noisy instantiation of something going on in the world. And the goal is to extract information about the world, something called inference. Um, and so you make some model and so on and so forth. Now, if what you're doing here takes the age of the universe to compute, or if what you're doing up here leads to worthless answers, you know, you're not going to be doing one or the other. But there really is a very sort of significant disconnect between these two perspectives that gets at what we're talking about. So regularization, as I said, it sort of rose an integral equation theory to solve in some sense ill posed problems. You compute a better or more robust solution. It involves explicitly sometimes, but more typically implicitly making some sort of assumptions about the data. 
uh, in the sense that this algorithm is, quote, the right thing to do for certain data but not other data. And it provides a trade-off between solution quality, typically measured by the objective function, and solution niceness, measured in some other way. Maybe the downstream person cares about it or whatever. All right, so it, essentially you can formalize it in various ways, but it, you know, what's going on is it provides a trade-off between solution quality and solution niceness. So the way it's usually implemented is the following. I want to optimize some f of x. And, you know, g of x uh, is, is the way I'm going to quantify niceness. So I might say g of x is the unit ball of the vector x, the one norm or the two norm or the infinity norm ball. And I optimize f of x plus lambda g of x. Lambda is a parameter to toggle between the two, the niceness and the objective function measure that's determined by some other criterion. And so you optimize this combined thing. So, for example, you might be interested in least squares regression. And you want to tack on plus lambda times a one norm constraint or a two norm constraint. If you think the data are sparse, you might put a one norm constraint. If you think the data are something else, you might put a two norm constraint. And conceptually here, the interesting thing is that oftentimes the problem, when you add regularization this way, you get a harder problem. You go from a vector space problem to a linear programming problem, which can be solved in this particular case in other ways. But you know, conceptually, you go to a harder problem. So the question we're going to have here is can we in some sense formalize the idea that approximate computation can implicitly lead to better or more regular solutions. So we'll do this in two different contexts. In the first, I'll be talking about an approximate computation of a certain vector, the top eigenvector of the Laplacian, and we'll have a very precise theoretical characterization of how the approximation algorithm is implicitly solving a regularized version of the original problem. The second example will have to do with a certain graph approximation algorithm, graph partitioning, if you're familiar with that. And we do not have as precise a theoretical characterization, but all the sort of theoretical evidence points in the right direction, and the empirical evidence is sort of overwhelming, and I'll also present that. So, um, the basic idea, we're given a Laplacian matrix A, symmetric, positive, semi-definite, some nice matrix, and uh, you take that matrix, and you choose a random vector, or an arbitrary vector, and you dot it into that matrix, and you iterate that process a million times. So that's the power method, all right? And there's lots of variants of it, but basically you iterate a million times. When you do it a million times, Measure zero events don't happen, certainly numerically, and so you're not going to choose something exactly in the, other, the wrong subspace. So when you do that a million times, you get the top eigenvector of the Laplacian. Exactly. What if you do this process three times? Or five, or ten, or twelve times? Right? Now clearly you get something that approximates that top eigenvector in the sense that the Rayleigh quotient is about right. Um, but can you in some sense say that you got a regularized version of the original problem? And variance of this is, is sort of what's done in practice. Um, so, a couple of different ways. I described the power method. There's a number, bunch of other different sort of diffusion-based versions of this. Heat kernel, you put some mass here, run for some number of time steps t. Page rank, you diffuse around and you do some global teleportation. There's a global teleportation parameter uh, gamma. Q steps of a lazy random rock. This is the power method, except it's a little bit lazy. So you do this three or four or five or 12 steps. So this is very common, and probably a lot of you have seen people run these sorts of diffusion-based procedures. And so the question is, if I run for some number of time steps, or if I jump with some probability, or if I do only three steps of the power method, I approximate the Rayleigh quotient in some sense, do I exactly solve some other problem, a regularized version of the Rayleigh quotient? So, uh, this is an optimization problem. The solution of this is the eigenvector you want. I'm not going to explain what all the letters are, but the point is I can write down the optimization problem. Um, and I could, you know, take my objective and put regularization there in the usual way. Now, alternatively, here the, vec this, the v x is a vector. Alternatively, I could write this as a semi-definite program. Um, so here x is an SPSD matrix. I've seemingly made the problem harder. Turns out you can take the solution of this to be rank 1. So capital X is equal to lowercase x, lowercase x transpose. And lowercase x is exactly that one. So these two are equivalent in that sense. And you know, if I want to make my life harder, I can do this. And you know, I could put my, the regularization here. So it turns out for a lot of these spectral methods, this is where the duality is the tightest. And so I'm going to be talking about this. Now, I'm going to be wanting to run a fast diffusion, so I'm not going to be solving any SDPs, but this is sort of what's going on under the hood. So let's look at this regularization, L dotted X plus lambda F of X. I've changed the letters from F, G to F, sorry. So let's call this an F A to SDP. I want to minimize L dot X plus, now I'm calling it 1 over A to F, subject to the usual constraints. So theorem, that's very straightforward to prove. Uh, given this setup, sufficient conditions for x star to be an optimal solution of this regularized SDP. So these are sufficient conditions for x star to be a solution to this thing. That x star satisfies these constraints and that x star is of this form. Now I'm not going to, again, explain all these letters, but the point is that if x star takes a particular form that is actually pretty nice. All right? So there's an explicit characterization here. And as a corollary of this, if I choose 
F appears there and F appears there. If I choose F to be a generalized entropy, then I get the heat kernel matrix and the number of time steps T corresponds to eta, the regularization parameter. If I choose F to be a log determinant, I get page rank and uh, the number of the teleportation parameters are going to be related to eta. And if I choose F to be a certain matrix P norm, then I get the truncated lazy random walk where whether I do three or four or five steps corresponds to a different value of the regularization parameter. So we, we heard yesterday, uh, two days ago, Dan Spielman saying when you're doing you know, more complicated iterative algorithms, you can use up randomness and so on, and it's tricky. So this sort of thing uh, you know, empirically is going on under the hood in much more general cases, but here we have a particularly simple setup, and we have a very precise characterization that when you run any of these diffusion-based procedures, these approximation procedures to approximate the top eigenvector of the Laplacian are exactly computing, exactly computing regularized versions of this Fiedler vector. All right? So the algorithm determines the f, and the iterations determines the algorithm determines the f. And the number of iterations determines the lambda. Is that right? Correct. The the eta to the lambda. Yeah. So what about something like the Langsos method? Can you do? I mean, is so, there an analogy because these are all diffusion based. Yeah. Uh, Langsos is a little bit more subspace. So the, so the Langsos is at. at the high level, no different than this. It's, it's an iteration. At each step, you need to orthogonalize and this and that. The orthogonalization makes things very tricky in terms of the analysis. Uh -huh. So empirically, that's going on. And um, I'm sure that, you know, at least in idealized forms of that, this sort of analysis would go through. Um, but, you know, if you look at actual Longsos code, there's a lot of complicated stuff going on, which would be hard to analyze. But th this is structurally no different than Longsos. Part of the reason it works also just has to do with, like, the Chebyshev polynomial. Right. So, so here, if you run a vanilla um, version of this diffusion, the power method, the, the vectors that, that Chebyshev solves, the vectors uh, become very ill-conditioned. Chebyshev solves that by keeping them orthogonal. Right. So this would go through to that. Okay. Yeah. All right, so here we computed an eigenvector, and you have a very crisp characterization of the sense in which approximate computation leads to a regularization implicitly. I haven't solved an SDP, right? I don't need to call an SDP solver. I just run three steps of the power method. All right, so you may ask, is this peculiar to vector computations, or can this apply more generally to graphs? So let's talk about graph partitioning. <clears throat> uh, there's a bunch of ways to formalize this. Basically, you want to split the graph into two sets of nodes. Both of them have some sort of internal niceness. Both of them are about the same size. There's a bunch of ways to formalize it. These are going to be intractable. All right, I'll be talking about conductance. If you're not familiar with conductance, it's, it's, basically, a, it's basically expansion. It's a degree-weighted version of expansion in the sense of an expanded graph. So it's a degree-weighted version of expansion. And the, the great thing about conductance is it's been studied from every sort of possible perspective, except maybe this one, but every sort of possible. So studied so a lot in theory, a lot in practice, by scientific computers, by numerical analysts, by machine learners, and so on. So there's a very good understanding of the lay of the land of both the theory and the practice. The lay of the land is there are spectral methods, compute an eigenvector, in fact, the eigenvector I was just talking about, and use that eigenvector to cut up the graph. There are flow-based methods. Totally different algorithm, totally different relaxation, doing something totally different related to multi-commodity flow. Um, very strong theory, lots of practice. Clearly, if you're going to implement these things in practice, you need to do local improvement, multi-resolution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you're familiar with the Aurora Rao Vazirani result, they basically combine these two in a certain way. But this is roughly the lay of the land. And so we're going to be talking about spectral and flow because they come with strong underlying theory and we actually know how they behave in practice. So to go through the underlying theory in just a little bit more detail, um, if you're familiar with this stuff, you've probably seen this, but maybe not in this perspective, and I'll talk at sort of a high level, but especially you compute an eigenvector, you appeal to Cheeger's inequality to get what's called quadratic worst case guarantees. <laughs> now these quadratic worst case guarantees are, in fact, in terms of the conductance. So there's no n number of nodes, you know, so you don't get some uh, approximation guarantee log n or whatever in terms of n. It's in terms of the structural parameter of the graph, which is awkward for theoretic computer science, right? Because we like to parameterize things in terms of the number of nodes, and you can hide all sorts of intractable stuff in graph parameters. But this is sort of a magical graph parameter. So it's quadratic in the worst case. You can ask, is this quadratic thing real or an artifact of the analysis? In fact, it is real. There are graphs that are that bad, basically Guadri Miller type, type cockroach graphs. And the worst case is a very local property basically having to do with this diffusion. It takes a lot of effort to push probability mass down the cockroach's leg, a one-dimensional thing. And this, in some sense, embeds you in a line or in a complete graph. Flow is a totally different method. You take the integer program and you relax it a very different way. You don't compute an eigenvector, you compute an LP. You're going to get log n worst case bounds. Nothing having to do with the structural parameter, but the usual depends on log n. Uh, worst case bounds are achieved on constant degree expanders, basically because you know, everyone's a uh, log-in distance from everyone else on average. 
Um, the worst case is a very global property. Nothing local going on. It has to do with the, you know, the global capacity uh, because everyone's on average a long distance away from each other. And this is effectively embedding you in L1. So you have two methods, complementary strengths and weaknesses. And this actually highlights a fairly egregious theory practice disconnect. Because if you ask anyone in theoretical computer science what's a good algorithm for graph partitioning, they'd say flow. It gives you log n, maybe ARV now, but they'd say flow. It gives you log n independent of anything in the graph. You know, maybe spectral's okay for expanders because the quadratic of a constant is a constant. If you ask anyone outside theoretical computer science, they may not have heard of flow, but they'd say, geez, your spectral is pretty darn good. The quadratic of a constant, you know, for anything we apply it to, spectral, the paper, spectral partitioning works for where everyone applies it to. That's not true because some people try and cut up things they shouldn't, but that's another story. Um, and so this is sort of, and, and they'd say, you know, why would you be cutting up an expander? That makes no sense. So this, this sort of highlights an, what seems to me sort of an egregious theory practice to this Theory people say algorithm A is better than B. Everyone else is B is better than A. It's a nice hygiene atom to ask the question, you know, what's going on if we want to go beyond worst case analysis. Empirically, what is determined, what you, if you look at the nodes you pull out of the graph with method A or method B, what you compute is determined at least as much by the approximation algorithm as the objective function. If you look at the nodes that you pull out of a graph, um, it will say more, in many cases, about whether you did a spectral approximation or a flow approximation than that you happen to use conductance as your objective or something else. So before, you know, we had an explicitly imposed geometry. We had G of X and so on and so forth. You explicitly added as an extra constraint or Lagrange multiplier. As many of you know, you know, what's under the hood in, in all sorts of approximation algorithms is embeddings. So you don't do it explicitly, but you take the graph, you stretch it out a bit in some strange way. It might be a log n stretch with Borghain's result or whatever. And you know, you embed it in a nice place. That nice place intuitively might be cutting, you know, trimming the corners or making it a little bit nicer or more robust or more useful for a downstream practitioner. So we don't have a crisp formalization of the way in which this is exactly doing uh, regularization in the way I had for the uh, eigenvector case. But you know, you may be a fair question, is this all nice talk or do you actually see this? So this work actually grew out of a large scale study of large social and information graphs that are you know, challenged at every niceness assumption you might want to imagine that the data have. In particular, they're expanders, not constant degree. And they have long stringy things that, you know, sparsity properties. So you might imagine that you'd see differences between spectral and flow. So um, Y axis here is the conductance, down is good. X-axis is size. Don't worry about why I'm tearing the graph up at multiple sizes. But say that I'm interested in finding you know, clusters of a thousand, a thousand nodes in my advertiser bitted phrase graph, whatever. So down is good. Red is flow, um, a flow-based method, and blue is a spectral-based method. And what you see here is that flow is clearly better than spectral, no questions asked. So you're, if you're interested in this class of graphs at this size scale, and you really believe conductance is what you want, there's no point in touching spectral. Flow is much better, period. Right. On the other hand, you might say, you know, is this useful for some downstream application? You know, the particular clustering or market identification or whatever. So on the right is two different niceness measures. Down is good. By niceness, you can quantify it a bunch of different ways. These particular ones are the diameter of the cost cluster and the size of the deepest cut inside the cluster. And in the size scale, in both of these cases, you get a lot of garbage also. But in both, you know, so you want to bias yourself down. In both of these cases, spectral, blue, is better than flow. Spectral is clearly better than flow. You're getting a much nicer, by these downstream metrics that people care about. Nicer set of nodes. All right? Step back, formalizations aside, this trade-off between solution quality and solution niceness is effectively the defining feature of regularization. Except I haven't tacked on regularization here. You're observing this as a function of two different approximation algorithms for the same intractable objective. Now you could say, geez, conductance is the wrong thing to be optimizing. Choose some conductance prime and optimize that. But conductance prime is intractable. You're going to have to relax it the same way, and you can relax it with spectral or flow or something else. So if you want to scale up to large graphs or to large matrices or whatever, you're going to have to be running some approximation algorithm. And what you see is determined at least as much by the approximation algorithm as the original objective. So um, in a lot of applications, um, you see these properties. And we have a very crisp characterization in one context of the way in which uh, approximation algorithms lead to implicit regularization. A lot of evidence and very strong theoretical evidence in another application. And um, it seems that, you know, as Michael Mitzemacher said this morning, you know, a lot of this stuff that we do is sort of tweaking worst case. And, and this, you know, is basically saying, what are you actually computing and what are the implicit properties in which you're actually computing? If you run algorithm A or B, what did you just compute and when is it in fact useful or not? So these approximation algorithms really aren't something we settle for. In many cases, they're better than the solution, the intractable thing. But clearly, you can't do that naively. 
Um, so I think that is, well, I know we've seen that applicable a lot more generally out of other applications. So with that, let me uh, wrap up and I guess we can head to lunch unless there's any questions. <laughs> <laughs>